Today we're going to continue uh, putting together all the techniques you've learned to analyze a collection of or a sequence of different series. Um, I'm going to try and get as much feedback from you as possible. I'm going to put the series up. I'm going to ask you if you think they converge or not, and I want you to give me feedback in terms of in the terms of a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and then we'll figure it out together. So we'll try and get through as many as possible. Let's start with this one. What about this? The sum as n equals one to infinity of n squared minus one over n to the three plus one. Thumbs up if you think this converges, thumbs down if you think it doesn't. Why? One thumbs up. Okay, perfect. So you are saying this thing for large n is a lot like just n squared over n to the 3, which is 1 over n for large n. And sure enough, 1 over n converges. So why does that help us? Sorry, 1 over n diverges. Why does that, why does that help us? Can you add to it? I mean, you're right, but just, just add, add some details if you can. Mm, you're, yeah, but implicitly you're using a principle. You're using you're using something we've we've learned in order to make this make this association here. What about the fact? Not quite. We're using something a bit a bit more sophisticated. You're almost there. Limit comparison test. Yeah. Limit comparison test. Because if we look at this guy. Indeed, for large n, it looks like this guy, right? They're both turning to zero, and the, 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 the correct way to think about this to, to, to give some, to give some, um, to, to, to cor the correct information about the way this thing looks like this thing is to consider this limit, the limit of this ugly, series over this beautiful series. Just the limit as it goes to infinity of n times. Let's factor out an n squared from the top. And let's factor out an n to the 3 from the bottom. And then we just have this limit. Oops. Which is equal to 1. So the ratio of these terms, this is the limit as n goes to infinity of a n plus 1, absolute value over a n. The ratio of these terms is equal to 1. And the limit as n goes to infinity. You know? So therefore, they are married. Oops. We have found a beautiful guy to marry the ugly guy to. You know? And whatever the beautiful guy does, the ugly guy does too. Right? They are now linked. Whatever one does, the other one does too. And so since 1 over n diverges, so does this guy. Let's just call it star. So it is star. Yeah? So if this was a free response, it, it wouldn't give you all the points just to say this. This is completely correct. But you need to explain more about why the fact that this sequence here is very much like this sequence allows you to conclude that this thing diverges. Yeah? So when we say this thing is like this thing, we, can, we have a more precise formulation of that. We have that the ratio of these terms tends to some limit which is not equal to zero. Yeah? And that's such strong information that it means that this series is married to the series 1 over n. I should write this down like this, since the series 1 over n 
So this series is married to this series, and therefore, since this guy diverges, this guy diverges. Cool. Everybody happy? Yeah? Give me a thumbs up. Good. Let's do another. Let's look at this one. So I'm doing exercises from the end of the section, which is a very good way to practice this because they don't tell you what method to use. They just present you with a series and you have to figure it out. So let's look at this. Does this thing converge? Thumbs up if you think yes, thumbs up if you think no. Okay, I'm seeing lots of thumbs up. All right, somebody who thinks, who thinks it does converge, give me a reason why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very good. Thank you. So, indeed, we need this, and that's clearly true because we have a power of n to the 3 on the top, sorry, on the bottom, and n squared on the top, so definitely it's going to 0. We also need this. We need these terms to be decreasing, right? Yeah, think of that. Um, they have to go down to 0, these terms be n. Yeah? And, it, and, and our intuition says it should happen because the top is growing slower than the bottom. So we think that this would be true, but we need to check it. So you can either do some kind of algebra and just carefully work that. What's the other thing we can do to check this? Take the derivative of what? This is just a sequence. So we need to take the derivative of perfect. Excellent. Excellent. Yep. To check. Let f of x be a function that recovers this guy. So this thing will do the job for us, right? Because f of n exactly is our sequence, right? So on our picture, this is our function, and it's going through our points exactly as we want, yeah? So we just need to check the derivative is zero. Right? Sorry, the derivative is negative, and the derivative is negative from any point onwards, right? It doesn't have to be negative for all x bigger than zero, or all x bigger than one, just there has to be some number somewhere where the derivative is negative from that point on, yeah? Because the convergence of the series just depends on starting anywhere. If you start anywhere and the series converges, then the series converges no matter where you start, yeah? Cool, so let's just check the derivative. Everything over the bottom squared. Differentiate the top guy. Leave the bottom guy alone. Minus. Leave the top guy alone. Differentiate the bottom guy. And what do we get from this? Let's put the powers of x to the 4 together. We have 2x to the 4 here. We can have minus 3x to the 4. So we're going to have a minus x to the power of 4. The next power we see is x squared. The next lowest power is x squared. And we're going to have a minus minus 3x squared here. So we're going to have a positive x, 3x squared from this thing. The next power is going to be x. So we're going to have a 2x from here. And that's the only thing, right? So we're going to have a plus 2x. And that's it. There aren't any constant terms. So this is our expression. And sure enough, this is negative for all x, which is large enough, because this x to the 4 is the dominant term. Yeah? Yeah, if we put the, consider the graph of this function, then ultimately, whatever it's doing for the first whatever from x to something, ultimately this x to the 4 term is the most significant term. So it will be indeed negative. Yeah? 
And when will it be negative? Uh, let's make a, a guess. So if we take, for example, x to the 10, then 10 to the 4. So 10 squared is 100. 100 squared is uh, 10,000. So we'll have minus 10,000. We'll have uh, plus 300 and then plus 20. So uh, when, when, when we're at 10, then for sure this thing is negative, And it'll be negative for anything which is bigger than 10. Do you see what I mean? Thumbs up if you're with me here. Okay, super. So, this is not the optimal x for which this is negative, but I don't care because I just need there to be some point where this thing is negative because that means all of these terms are decreasing from that point onwards. So, the series from n equals 10 to infinity converges and therefore the entire series converges. Yeah? So I have to squeeze this in. Let's call this guy star star. And that's it. Everybody happy? Everybody clear on all of this? Any questions before I raise? Speak up now. Okay, cool. Let's do some more. What about this? This is question seven. So it's one over n square root of log of n. Thumbs up if you think this converges, thumbs down if you think it doesn't. Yeah, uh, well, 1 over n diverges, and what's the relationship between 1 over n and this guy? Yeah. So it's a bit like 1 over n. So it's tempting, exactly as you did, to compare it to 1 over n. But if we think about what the relationship is, this thing is less than 1 over n because log n is slowly increasing, right? So the bottom here is bigger than the bottom here, yeah? Yeah? So what can we learn from this relationship? Come on, we have a lot to cover. And please, let's have everybody take part, or at least uh, as many people as possible. So. I, I'm hearing uh, the same kind of voices, you, people interacting a lot. Thank you so much for this. I, wanna, I want everybody, I want everybody to, to take part. So, someone new, give me information. What can we conclude from this? Yeah, excellent. So one over n diverges, right? So if these blocks represent one over n, then these blocks, represent the series, huh? Yeah? That we're considering. And it's underneath these guys. And these guys diverge. So if you have something which is underneath a collection of blocks whose area is infinite, then that doesn't tell you anything. It could be infinite, it could be finite. Yeah? So um, thank you very much for, for whoever suggested looking at 1 over n because it's a very natural thing to do. But in this case, it's not, it's not helpful. So it's a really good, it's a really good guide whenever you have something which has some kind of peak power or looks like, looks like for large n, something like 1 over n to the p. Then that's a really good guide compared to 1 over n. In this case, it fails you because you're on the wrong side of 1 over n. So what other methods could we use? Compare it to 1 over square root of n. 
We have a similar problem with that because, look, if we look at n log n, this is indeed bigger than the square root of n. You know? So 1 over square root of n is bigger than 1 over n log of n. And 1 over square root of n diverges, as you know, so we have the same kind of issue there. It's underneath something that diverges. So it's worth thinking about, it's worth trying, but it doesn't help us. What else could we do? Limit comparison test is like a fancier version of, of the comparison test, right? And uh, so far we not have any luck, because the only natural thing we can think to compare it to, the only beautiful guy we can try and marry this guy to is 1 over n, and that limit doesn't exist. If we look at the limit of, it doesn't exist as a positive, or as a non-negative, as a non-zero number. If we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of this guy, 1 over n square root of log n over this beautiful guy, then this limit is the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over square root of log n, which is equal to zero, which tells us nothing. The limit has to be not equal to zero for us to get something. So they're not married. Not married. Unless you can find another beautiful guy to compare this guy to. But this is not the guy. They are not married. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, uh, one of you say that again. <laughs> No, that's a good suggestion. All right. Integral test. Tell me what I have to do to use the integral test. So what I have to do. Yeah. If the integral from 1 to infinity converges, yes. So this function recovers our sequence, right? So fn is equal to this. Right? So the picture is this. So this is our collection of terms, which we are summing like this. And it converges if and only if the area of all of these blocks Add it up all the way to infinity is finite. And this function exactly is this one here, right? Because this is 1, this is 2, this is 3. So f1 is equal to the first term, f2 is equal to the second term, f3 the third term. So this is what this looks like, right? This looks like this, you know? And then we see that if the area underneath the graph of this function is finite, as we integrate from 1 to infinity, or 5 to infinity, or any number to infinity, then that means the area of all these blocks is finite. Yeah? Therefore, it converges. So all we need to do is to check the convergence of this guy. Yeah? And there's a converse to this theorem, if that if the area of all of this underneath this graph here is actually infinite, then these blocks are infinite. And that follows because if we just consider this function, g of x, which is equal to f of x plus 1, then as we saw, this guy exactly lives underneath the blocks. This guy lives underneath the blocks. So this guy is g. Right? So this guy here is f. That's a little bit harder to see, but it's not that hard to see. If we just take g of 1, that's the same as f of 2. So g of 1 is here. It is equal to the second term, goes a2, like this. This is a2. g of 3, g of 2 is equal to g of 3, so it's here. g of 3 is equal to a of 4, so it's here. So we see that this function is exactly doing what we want. It lives underneath. Yeah? And the integral of this function, g, will converge if and only if the integral of f converges, because all we've done is shift it by 1 to the right. That's a quick review of the integral test. So this thing 
converges if and only if this integral converges when we start from anywhere. Is this coming back? This is the integral test, this is the picture. This is what it means. All we're doing is comparing blocks to graphs. Yeah? Good. So with this, we can just do the calculation. So if we integrate, let's take any number, let's take one. Could be anything. One over x, square root of x. How are we going to integrate this? What do you want to do to integrate this? Good. What's the use of? Good. The u by dx is 1 over x. So du equals dx over x. We recover this dx over x structure here. At this point, you know this well. We change the limit. So this is actually the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to r of 1 over x log of x dx. Now we're going to do the u sub limit as r goes to infinity. When uh, x is equal to 1, u is equal to 0. When x is equal to r, we have log of r. And then this thing just becomes 1. Whoops, it's supposed to be the square root. Uh, 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 uh. This becomes 1 over the square root of u du. What about this thing? Does it converge or not? Yep, it diverges. We can either just plug in the antiderivative, or we notice that this is exactly the same as this thing. And we've learned well that this thing will diverge because generally this improper integral of type 1 converges if and only if p is bigger than 1. We need this thing to go to 0 fast enough. Yeah? This was the thing we talked a lot about, that 1 over x was the critical case, which diverges. So if we're going to 0 faster than 1 over x, we're OK. Faster in a power sense. In a slower or equal to, then we're not OK. Yeah? Are you OK? Or shall I? We can also just calculate this. We can also just figure out what the antiderivative is. Let me do that as well. <laughs> So this is the limit as r tends to infinity, 0 to log of r. What do we differentiate to get this? This is u to the minus a half, so let's try u to the half. If we differentiate this, we have a half in front, which we don't want, so we put 2 here. That's the antiderivative, and then that's the limit as r tends to infinity. Let's take out the 2 of uh, log of r square rooted minus 0. And log of r increases as r goes to infinity, of course, so does the square root of this, so this is equal to infinity, so diverges. Yeah? Everybody with me here? Thumbs up if you're with me. Okay, let's imagine we had a slightly different thing. What about if we had this? What if we had log of n to the uh, 7 over 6? What if we had this? I'm going to raise the board. You guys look at this. You people look at this. Tell me if you think this converges or not. We can do the integral test again, right? So. From thinking about the last problem, we didn't get anywhere with the, with the easier methods. We had to use the integral test. And that's kind of the last resort because it's an actual calculation we have to do. And it's generally the case with this type of thing, that there isn't an easy way. This is right on the edge of being either non-convergent or convergent. It's an incredibly subtle case. Right? Most of these tests uh, work because the series we're considering definitely does one thing or the other. It's not a close. It's not a. It's not right on the edge. But this guy is so much on the edge of the critical case, the one over n case, that we can't use a test. We have to actually use a calculation, the integral test. And what we did was compared it to the integral of 
1 over x uh, times square root of x. Now we consider this thing by the same method, by the same considerations, we have to consider this. 1 over x log of x to the 7 over 6. No? Exactly the same reason. We just recover these terms with this function, 1 over x log of x to the 7 over 6. And then by the integral test, this thing converges, if and only if this thing converges. Yeah? And then this thing we do the same u sub with, right? So let's write this as the limit as r goes to infinity of this thing. And we do u is equal to log of x, same stuff, du equals dx over x. And then this is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of 0 to the log of r. And then this thing becomes 1 over u to the 7 over 6. Yeah? du. Yeah? Uh, I don't want to start from 0 in this case because we have a blow up. Let me start from 2. And, and, uh, actually, let me start from 3. Yeah? Everybody with me? Yeah? And we need to check that this thing is going to be a decreasing function, but we can check in the same way. That'll be okay. And, well, actually, we don't need to check. Take that back. This is definitely a decreasing function because as x increases and as log increases, then the bottom is increasing. Therefore, the top is, therefore, this entire expression is decreasing. So this is definitely something we can use the integral test for. And if we look at this thing, then we know this converges because this is the improper integral of type 1, and this is a power which is bigger than 1. Yeah? Yeah, it's coming back. Yeah. And if you forget this, you could just find the antiderivative of this thing, right? The antiderivative will, 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 will be an expression that will actually converge. Right, so once again, 1 over x is the critical case. If we have 1 over x to the p, which is where p is bigger than 1, it's going to 0 fast enough that it will converge. Yeah? Just, just, just because we can do this calculation, right? So we ask ourselves, what antiderivative do we have to get this thing? If we do x to the 1 minus p over 1 minus p, if we differentiate this, we get x to the minus p, yeah? And then if we take this limit, so we take limits from 1 to r of this thing. Since p is bigger than 1, this is a negative thing here, so let's keep that. Let's put minus p minus 1, and then what is this? This is r to the 1 minus p minus 1, like this. Since p is bigger than 1, this 1 minus p again is negative, so as r goes to infinity, this thing vanishes, right? So then this just tends to minus 1 over p minus 1 times minus 1, which is just equal to 1 over p minus 1, therefore it converges. Yeah? Everybody with me there? Everybody remember this? Give me a thumbs up if this makes sense to you. Give me a thumbs down if it doesn't. Okay. No judgment, just so that I know where everybody is. Give me a thumbs up if this is, if this, if you remember this. Give me a thumbs down if you don't. Okay, I'm only seeing thumbs up. If you don't remember this, then um, that's a kind of a sign that, that you're not keeping enough, up enough with the content. So as a, math is a cumulative thing. So if you're really happy with this thing, then this part now becomes trivial. Well, not trivial, but becomes very straightforward. Yeah? And if you're shaky about this, if you're not completely sure about 
type one integrals and proper integrals, then when you get to this thing, then you're also not really sure what's happened. So you're building this shakier and shakier building because the each layer is a bit shaky and the one on top's even more shaky, right? So that's what you need to avoid. You can build your shaky building up to a certain level and then it's just too unstable and then it just falls down. You can't get any further. So you want to really nail down everything we talk about as we learn it. Be really solid on it. That's by far the most efficient way to do this course or any math course. Get completely happy with everything we're talking about so that when we talk about stuff that builds on the stuff we've already done, that is fine too. Yeah? Not being completely happy with it and then having to go back and try and understand it properly this time, that, that makes it really hard. So you're going to have to keep going back, 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 solidifying your foundations before you get to understand what we're talking about at the moment. That makes the stuff hard. So don't do it that way. Nail everything down as we talk about it. And that'll save you a lot of time, a lot of energy, probably almost out of time. Leave it any time. I want to, I want to do a couple more examples. All right, so we're here and we know that this thing converges. So the integral converges. Sorry, so the series converges or star converges. So it's very similar to the last series, right? It's very similar to the last series, except in the last series we had this power to a half, and now we have this power seven to the six, seven over six. Yeah, which shows how delicate this thing is. Yeah, the previous guy was underneath one over n. Yeah, but it wasn't wasn't going fast enough to zero. It wasn't quite going fast enough to zero. But if we just change the exponent slightly, yeah then this thing is going fast enough to zero. And as someone pointed out right, right when we started discussing this thing, this log n is incredibly slowly growing compared to n. So these series, if you were to draw these series, you would have to draw many, many terms, many, many blocks before you notice much of a difference because they seem really close together. Yeah, is there, it, it would be a long and kind of slow thing to do this, to draw this by hand. <laughs> But if you did it, you'd see, you'd really, they'd look very, very close together. Maybe plot, plot this, write some code, plot this in, in Mathematica if you're, if you're tech savvy to do this, and you'll see how similar they look. Yeah? But one converges and one diverges. Yeah? And a good thing to remember whenever you see something like this, one over n log to something, is firstly remember it's the integral test. And if you just think about what we did a bit more, it will turn out that if we do this, to the p for any p, it will converge if p is bigger than 1, because after doing this, this integral test, that thing will reduce down to the integral of 1 over x to the p. Yeah? So if p is bigger than 1, this thing is just going fast enough to 0. And if it's not bigger than 1, then it won't. So you do this, do this general integral for general p, and then you'll be convinced about every example like this. And that's a very good exercise to do, because you're not going to get confused by, by this thing. Yeah? Cool. So... It's reasonable to expect something like this, because this is a subtle example where most of our tools don't work, where we have to use the last resort tool, which is the integral test, last resort, because it involves doing a calculation. And uh, this guy is quite easy to understand once you learn this general thing. And this general thing is just exactly the same calculation we did, except just for general p. Okay, let's do some more. Let's do something a bit more challenging. All right, this one's fun. What about this? This is 14. What about this thing? Sine of n over 1 plus 2 to the n. Does this thing converge? Thumbs up if you think yes. Thumbs down if you think no. I only see thumbs up. All right, good. Somebody 
Please venture why. And what would be great is if someone who hasn't spoken yet. Doesn't matter if you're wrong. Just want to know what you're thinking. Give me a reason why. Can you add to that? So I agree that if we if we draw this picture, then we'll see blocks that are both positive and negative, right? So they have positive and negative blocks. Yeah, but whatever their sign, they are getting smaller really, really fast, right? They're getting smaller really, really fast because, as you say, sign is between minus one and one, and two to the end is blowing up very fast. So. Our intuition is that if we try and add up blocks like this, then we'll end up with some finite quantity, right? If we think about this as a sequence of steps, we're either going forward, forward, or backward, but our step sizes are going to zero really quick. So we'd expect to actually end up at some point at infinity, yeah? But let's justify this. What principles allow us to conclude this? What principles have we learned? Say it louder. It's tempting to try and use the alternating series test because that's the main test, one of the main tests we learned for, for, for series that don't have positive terms. But is this an alternating series? Is this an alternating series? Let's look at the graph of sine, look at this. This is the graph of sine, right? This is pi, this is two pi, yeah? So, Pi is 3.1 something something. So one is around here. No, one is around here. Two is around here. No? Is this an alternating test? Is this an alternating series? No. It's not, right? If it was an alternating series, then these terms would have to go positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, and it's definitely not doing that, right? Because the first term will be positive, the second term will be positive, uh, even the third term will be positive, but then the next one will be negative, and then negative, and then negative, and then negative, yeah? So it's not alternating. And it doesn't even have a nice pattern because, because pi is an irrational number, so we can't even say it's going to be three positive and then three negative. That's not true either. It's going to be much more complicated than that. So, what else could we do? The intuition is correct. How can we look at this picture? How can we how can we use some of our principles to make this intuition more precise, more locked down? What have we learned? It's hard to say it's decreasing because it's going because it's positive and negative, but something's decreasing. The absolute value, yeah? The absolute value is also not quite decreasing, but it's helpful to look at the absolute value, because if we look at the absolute value, then we just have that these blocks are all positive, right? Because sine is bouncing Yeah, so, so what we actually want to do is, is what? We want to, so what you're saying is let's look at, let's look at, let's look at one over one plus two to the n. What's the relationship between this thing and this thing? What's the relationship between these terms and these terms? Is it greater? So sine is between, it's not identically equal to either. Smaller, right? Yeah. So sine is between minus one and one if we take the absolute value of sine. Yeah, 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 cool. So this stuff, this these terms are less than these terms, yeah, yeah. So if we consider this series, the sum from n equals 1 to infinity, sine of n over 1 plus 2 to the n, yeah? this is less than this thing, right? 
just by the comparison test, just because we can consider the picture. If we consider this guy, 1 over 1 plus 2 to the n, then that thing, if we draw these blocks, they're always above. Right? They're always above. And this thing converges because, as you pointed out straight away, someone pointed out straight away, this thing is going to zero fast enough, so this thing converges. Yeah. So therefore, oops, I've missed out the absolute values. So therefore, this guy here converges. Yeah. This guy here converges. Because if it's less than a series that converges, just consists of positive terms, then it converges itself. Yeah, that's the comparison test. Cool, but that is not exactly the guy we want because the guy we want is this one and we have this one. So, what do we do? What do we do? Yes, and? Excellent, yeah. So, sum n equals 1 to infinity, sine of n over 1 plus 2n converges absolutely. So, it converges because we learned that converging absolutely is a stronger property than converging, right? If we draw the picture of a blob that represents all the series that converge, then the ones that converge absolutely are some subset, right? So this is converge absolutely. And these guys are a subset, a strict subset of all the guys that converge. We proved this, this wasn't hard to see. So if we can show something converges absolutely, then it definitely converges. And just to recap, the guys that converge but do not converge absolutely, these guys here, converge conditionally. Because it's conditional on the sign. Converge conditionally. Yeah. So, second, well, not a second, but, uh, or maybe, maybe the second. The second thing to think about when we have a series that isn't consisting of positive terms is, does it converge absolutely? If we take the absolute value of it, can we control that by something and show that the absolute value of it converges and therefore the series converges? Because when something converges absolutely, it converges. Yeah? And these are the two things we have to, the two things we can play with when we have a series that don't have uh, just positive terms, when they're positive and negative. It'll either be alternating, and if it's alternating, then we're going to check that the function that recovers the bn, where the bn are the positive, right? Write that down, not to confuse you. So if we have an alternating series, looks like this, minus 1 to the k minus 1 bk, where bk are positive, right? So it's alternating between positive and negative, positive and negative, and we need these bk to go to zero, and be decreasing. So, and bk plus 1 is less than bk, and the limit has to go to 0. So, if it's not an alternating series, then it's probably something like this, where we take the absolute value and we can control that thing, show it converges, therefore the series converges. Because that's the only thing we've learned about series that have positive and negative terms. So if you keep that in mind, you should be okay. You should be okay. You should not be stumped by a series that have positive and negative terms. A common thing is to, is to only remember alternating series and then try and treat this like an alternating series and it's not one. It's just not one. If you draw the picture of sign and just look at the terms, you see it's not an alternating series. So that can't work. But comparing it to the absolute value, showing the absolute converges, that thing is straightforward. huh? Let me say that again. Taking the absolute value and then showing the absolute value converges, that thing is straightforward. So you should be, you should have no problem with series with negative terms. There's only two things we can do. Everybody happy. Everybody good.